Chapter 1, A Simple Promise, George. My eyes followed the dentist's gloved hands from the silver tray next to my chair to my wide open mouth. What's that for, I asked, pointing at the funny looking pliers he was holding. At 11, I sported a set of seriously crooked teeth, and my mother had taken me to the University of Medicine and Dentistry in Newark to get braces that we hoped would improve my smile. My curiosity must have impressed the dentist, because he not only explained his tools and how he planned to use them, he also taught me the names and number of teeth and how to count and classify them. A few minutes later, he quizzed me to see how much I remember. Our little game left me so excited that I could hardly wait for my next appointment. That was when I began thinking about becoming a dentist someday. I don't remember the dentist's name, but I never forgot what he did for me gave me a dream and there was no greater gift for a smart kid growing up in a place where dreams were snatched away all the time i spent the first seven years of my life in apartment 5g of the stellar right housing projects with my mother and older brother our building was a graffiti covered 13 story high rise with elevators that smelled like urine and sometimes didn't work like public housing projects in major cities across the country the stellar right development was massive 16 high rises stretched over two blocks they were packed with hundreds of poor families like mine, mostly mothers and children, few fathers in sight. My favorite place was the playground, but like so many structures around the development, it stayed in disrepair. My friends and I were constantly climbing, jumping, and swinging on broken down equipment that daily threatened our lives. One day when I was five, I was playing on the wooden jungle gym and tried to skip over a missing plank to get to the sliding board. My jump was short and I missed. My small body slipped through the gap and slammed to the ground below. The impact knocked me unconscious. My brother Garland, just six and a half then, rushed over, slapped my face over and over again, and tried to scoop my body up in his arms, thinking I was dead. Blood gushed from the back of my head. He screamed for our mother. Our mother, Ella Jenkins Mack, has always been the dominant figure in my life. I was just a toddler when she and my father, George Jenkins Sr., divorced. When I was two, we moved from South Carolina, where I was born, to Newark. I rarely saw my father after that. He came around a few times when I was in high school, sent $500 or so for toys at Christmas, and attended my graduations. But we never spent the kind of time together that builds a relationship. As soon as my mother, brother, and I moved to the projects in a building on Muhammad Ali Avenue, my mom started working to get us out. She was a proud woman, and she didn't like living in public housing. She wanted to make it on her own. Raised on a farm with eight brothers and sisters in Warrington, South Carolina, she had been taught to fend for herself. She developed a toughness that at times made her seem emotionless, but her determination and consistency stabilized our lives. I never saw life break her down. If she struggled to pay the bills, and I know there must have been times when she did, her children never saw it. When Garland and I did well, she praised us without gushing. And we knew better than to expect a reward for doing what we were expected to do, like cleaning our room or making a good grade on a report card. Mom began working as a financial customer service representative for Chubb Insurance Company in 1978 and still works there today. By the time I was seven, she had saved enough money to move us out of the projects. We moved a block away to Hyde Park Gardens, a private complex with landscaped gardens, grass, and a few trees. The complex operated like a co-op. Each tenant bought stock for $2,400 and got a discount on the rent. We could see our old building and the projects from the back window. Four years later, my mother married Garland's father, Haywood Matt, a decent and quiet man with a southern drawl that tied him to his South Carolina roots. He had been around for most of my life, but we never connected emotionally. He didn't treat me differently because I was his stepson. It just seemed he was at a loss for how to develop a relationship with me or even with his biological son when he re-entered our lives full time. My stepfather didn't care much for sports, so we couldn't bond while watching the Knicks on television or sharing hot dogs at Mets games at Shea Stadium. He always seemed to be working on cars, but he never pulled us under the hood with him for the kind of interaction that can bring a father and son together. He kept mostly to himself and played an auxiliary role, more like an uncle transporting us where we needed to go and occasionally giving us money. He wasn't unkind, and I know at times he must have felt like an outsider 
who could never quite break into the tight triangle that was my mother, my brother, and me. Six years into the marriage, Garland and I returned to the apartment after school one day and noticed that the VCR was missing from its spot underneath the television in the living room. We walked from room to room and discovered that in our parents' bedroom, someone had rifled the dresser drawers and left them open. We were sure we had been robbed. I called mom as quickly as my fingers could press the numbers. When I told her what had happened, she started laughing. It seemed a strange response for a woman who had just learned that she had been ripped off. But she knew the truth. My stepfather had packed all of his stuff and left. Just like that, he was gone. The closest thing to a father I ever knew was my friend's dad, Shahid Jackson. Shahid Jr. was one of the first kids I met in the new apartment complex. Everybody called him Cash. He attended Spencer Elementary, too, and we hit it off right away. He was a quiet, passive guy, and I was the big brother type, so our personalities complemented each other. We never argued. We played video games at his house every day. His father was the coolest dad I had ever met. He treated me like I was one of his sons. He was the kind of dad who often bent the rules in his child's favor. With his boisterous personality, Mr. Jackson was as comfortable talking to a crack dealer on the corner as he was chatting with the mayor. As a former bodyguard to stars, including Smokey Robinson and Muhammad Ali, he traveled frequently when we were in elementary school. When he returned from his road trips, he showered us all with gifts. Whatever he bought for his two sons, he bought for me too. When he eventually joined the police force and took over the police athletic league, we played on his baseball and basketball teams. He took us fishing and to work out with him in the gym. We often just rode around town in his van and stopped to eat out at restaurants. He was the first person to take me out for Portuguese food and the first to introduce me to filet mignon, which he cooked himself. One of his favorite stops was a deli called Cooper's, where we ordered the best triple-decker sandwiches I've ever eaten. Mr. Jackson always let me know he believed in me. When I told him while I was in high school that I'd enrolled in the pre-medical, pre-dental plus program at Seton Hall with two of my friends, he wasn't surprised. From that point on, when he talked about my future, he always prefaced his remarks with, when you become a doctor. I was still barely able to imagine that myself. In many ways, mom was my father too. She was until she married my stepfather, the family's sole provider. We were lucky to have a babysitter who treated us like her own children, Miss Willie, an old fashioned woman who lived three blocks away. Sometimes when she was working full time, mom dropped us off before sunrise and couldn't pick us up until nightfall because she had to work late. If either of us was sick or if it was too cold or stormy outside, Miss Willie insisted that Garland and I stay overnight at her house so mom wouldn't have to drive us back and forth in the bad weather. She even took care of us for several days when my mother went into the hospital. But when I turned six, mom gave us keys to the apartment and we started going home alone after school. We had to call her at work as soon as we made it indoors. Because of her steady job, our pantry and refrigerator were always full of food. We didn't move constantly like some families did, but lived in the same apartment for the rest of my childhood. And mom kept the utility bills paid too. I was fortunate. Most of the guys I know who got into trouble in my neighborhood had circumstances at home that weren't as stable. Many guys I knew sold drugs because they felt they had no choice. And I believe that kids who grew up in less stable environments were more susceptible to pressure from friends to do the negative things everyone else was doing. Sam and Ramik faced those pressures all the time. It wasn't that I was any smarter or more special than the guys around me. For some reason, throughout my life, I was blessed with people who told me positive things, and I believed them. I believed my third grade teacher when she told me that I could go to college and have a great career someday if I just stayed out of trouble. So I hung out with kids who were like me, trying to do the right thing. Most of the time, they were either my age or a bit younger. The older guys seemed too advanced, too ready to rush into the life I was trying to avoid. Even when, as a teenager, I tried to hang out with Garland and his friends, he wouldn't allow it. He wasn't necessarily trying to protect me. He just didn't want his kid brother hanging around. But it kept me away from a group of guys who weren't the least bit interested in school. I always wished for a little brother or sister, so I became a big brother to my friends. Sure, I wanted the other kids to think I was cool. What kid doesn't? But I decided then that I wasn't going to do certain things, like sell drugs, and I just stuck to my decision. Guys in the neighborhood, even the gun-toting tough guys who stayed in trouble, 
didn't hassle me about doing well in school. If they laughed at me or called me punk, geek, nerd, or corny, they did so behind my back. I walked the same dangerous streets as the guys selling drugs and stealing cars, and I was cool with many of them. I didn't look down on them, and they didn't bother me. It was as if there was some silent acknowledgement between us that they were doing what they believed they had to do, and so was I. As soon as I was responsible enough to work, I got a job. I was 13 when Blonnie Watson, president of the board that operates High Park Gardens, hired me as a groundskeeper at the complex. She liked me and went out of her way to be kind and encouraging. I earned minimum wage picking up trash around the building and doing minor chores. But I was thrilled to be able to afford some of the trendy clothes and shoes that my mother refused to buy. Because mom worked so much, she had little time to visit the schools my brother and I attended or talk to our teachers. She went to open house meetings every now and then and fussed if we brought home bad grades on our report cards. But she was not a check your homework every night kind of mom. She was too exhausted when she got home from work. My brother took full advantage of her leniency. He chose to tolerate the verbal punishment at report card time rather than buckle down, study, and bring home decent grades. I love school. My third grade teacher, Viola Johnson, was largely responsible for that. By then, we were out of the projects, but like most of the kids in my class, I was poor. That meant nothing to me then because I never felt deprived, especially in Miss Johnson's class. She was a tiny ball of energy with a high-pitched, girlish voice and the same honey-colored complexion as my mother. Miss Johnson had lived in Newark since she was four years old. She attended public schools and followed her father's trail into teaching. Once she began teaching, she was always taking classes somewhere, a drama class here, a literature class there, and she brought what she learned to her classroom. When I met her, Miss Johnson was in her mid-40s, single with no children. I guess her students filled that space in her heart because she nurtured us like a mother. She told us that college was not just an option, but the next step to advancement, like the 13th grade. Everybody has a chance to go to college, she said. Never say you can't go because of money. Get that degree. You must get that degree. She regularly got discount tickets for us to attend Broadway plays. She asked parents to pay for the tickets, and we rode to New York City on a bus that she usually rented herself. And we did not dare dress tacky. Miss Johnson required the girls to wear dresses and stockings, and the guys to wear nice slacks and shirts. She also secured the scripts of popular plays, assigned roles, and rehearsed us so that we can perform for the entire school. When we put on a production of Annie, I played Daddy Warbucks. Miss Johnson introduced us to algebra and Shakespeare with books written for kids. We even formed a Shakespeare club that met on Tuesdays after school. I was elected president. We read and discussed Shakespeare at our meetings. At one meeting, the club voted on our official uniform, burgundy sweaters with the group's name, the Shakespeare Club, embroidered over the pocket. Once, we wore our sweaters to a concert at Symphony Hall. Several people in the audience asked Miss Johnson which private school we attended. She smiled, held her head high, and announced with great pride that we were from Louise A. Spencer Elementary, a public school in the Central Ward, which practically everyone in Newark considered the ghetto. Our teacher loved to travel, and she always sent us postcards and bought us souvenirs from wherever she went. Some days, she pulled the globe from the corner of the classroom, gathered us around her, and told us stories about places that before were just spots on a map to us. Noise didn't seem to bother Miss Johnson as long as children were engaged in learning. She stayed with us after school to dye eggs for Easter, make gingerbread men for Christmas, or bake cookies just because. Miss Johnson retired from Newark's public schools in 1993 after 32 years of teaching and moved to Johnsonville, West Virginia, a tiny town named after her great grandfather. I lost touch with her when I left Spencer and for years didn't know where she had gone. But I never forgot her. She made a lanky, mild-mannered kid growing up in a tough place feel smart and special. She also made me curious about the world I had yet to see. That was the curiosity the dentist saw in me the day I showed up at his office to get braces. Four, common ground. 
George. Sometimes people are drawn together for a purpose that even they don't recognize at the time. I am convinced that this is what happened with Sam, Ramik, and me. Almost as soon as Sam and I met in the seventh grade, we realized we liked the same things. Baseball, basketball, video games, Nike sneakers, and the latest fashions and clothes. We did our work in school, but we weren't nerds. We didn't allow school to consume us. It seemed that most students were either so smart that they had little or no social skills, or they were so sociable that they goofed off during class and neglected their schoolwork. I tended to lean toward people who offered a balance. That's what I saw in Sam. He and I often ended up sitting next to each other, learning lessons together, sharing candy and stories about our lives and the happenings in our neighborhoods. All of the seventh and eighth graders at University High School have been recommended by a teacher, guidance counselor, or principal at our elementary schools and had been required to pass a test for admittance. University High, one of Newark's three magnet high schools, had earned a solid reputation for sending a high percentage of its graduates to colleges and universities each year. The school boasts an 85 to 90 percent rate of its graduates completing college in four or five years. The school grew out of research in the late 1960s that indicated that many of the public school system's graduates were academically unprepared to accept jobs beyond menial labor. Corporations were complaining that they were having trouble meeting new federal guidelines for hiring more minority workers. To respond to the crisis, in 1969, the Newark system initiated a magnet program called School Within a School at Southside High School, which later became Malcolm X Shabazz High School. The students considered gifted were separated from the general population there and provided with a more rigorous college preparatory curriculum. In 1976, the program leased the building, relocated, and became the school that is now known as University High School. Two years later, it became the only public high school in Newark to begin admitting 7th and 8th graders. Administrators have found that students entering in ninth grade weren't getting the background they needed to prepare them for college in four years. Every year since, the school has selected top 7th graders from the city's elementary schools and started them early with college preparatory courses that, by the 8th grade, included algebra, honors English, and a foreign language, often Latin. The school moved to 55 Clinton Place, its current location, in 1982. The predominantly black neighborhood around the school is mostly working class, but there are pockets of high crime areas that have caused problems for students over the years. The blocks around Hawthorne Avenue were the worst. If you weren't ready to fight when you walked around there, you risked getting mugged. Students often got robbed of their sneakers, jackets, and bus cars on the way to school or home. I rode the bus to and from school every day, but I went in the opposite direction. By the end of the seventh grade, Sam and I had become pretty good friends and were hanging out regularly during lunch. We played basketball, sat outside under the trees and played cards, or just sat in the cafeteria, banged out a beat on the table, and rapped. I was also tight with Faith Evans, now a well-known pop singer who had attended Spencer Elementary with me. She was mature for her age, too mature to have any interest in me beyond little brother. Even then she was beautiful, and she dated guys who were at least three years older. She often shared her boyfriend business with me and sought advice, but given my limited experience with girls at the time, I could only offer a sympathetic ear. In the evenings after school, I spent hours playing video games with my neighborhood friend Jackson or football in the apartment complex parking lot with some of the other guys on the block. Within three blocks of the apartment complex where I live, there were at least 15 guys around my age. We broke up into cliques with two different groups doing things I just wasn't willing to do. They sold drugs, stole cars, beat up guys outside of their circle and caused all kinds of havoc in the neighborhood. The rest of us hung out together and avoided the troublemakers, though sometimes we all got together for football. I didn't know it then, but Sam was having a more difficult time staying away from trouble. His friends tended to be older and more influential. With his engaging personality, Sam has always attracted lots of friends. 
His loyalty was tested on a regular basis. And in his neighborhood, he had to fight to prove that he could walk the streets without being intimidated. Though he was always friendly, you got the feeling there was more going on inside of his head than he let on. He held it all inside. I'm quieter, more reserved. I'm not shy, just a laid back, take me as I am or leave me kind of guy. In some ways, I think that this protected me. Maybe the troublemakers figured I didn't have the heart to hang with them. I don't know. I just know they didn't bother me. They didn't try to persuade me to join them, and they didn't try to make my life miserable by picking on me. Sam and I participated in our first graduation ceremony together after completing the eighth grade. Ramik arrived the next year, but Sam and I didn't become close friends with him until our junior year. University High had a strong math and science bent. It offered summer and weekend programs, underwritten by oil and chemical companies interested in producing more engineers, scientists, and mathematicians. We participated in some of those programs, but quite frankly, high school wasn't as challenging as the seventh and eighth grades had been. We had a few dedicated teachers at the high school who pushed us to learn and forced us to do our work, but too many others just didn't know how to reach us and didn't seem to care. They expected and accepted mediocrity or less, and unfortunately, we usually gave no more. I got mine. Now, you got to get yours, exasperated teachers often told us. I no longer felt challenged, and my academic performance began to slip. I made average grades, but I could have done better if I had worked harder. Sam, who had graduated number three in our eighth grade class, also dropped to average performance. Ramik made all A's and B's in our freshman year, but his grades dropped too in later years. All three of us began to skip classes. It was a common practice among students at our school. We knew we could get away with it, and we did. Ramik was quiet and low-key during our freshman year. He was still learning his way around his new school. He remained close to his friends in Plainfield and spent time with them. During lunch and between classes, I saw him hanging out with guys who rode the bus with him from his uncle's neighborhood. His two neighborhood buddies didn't return for our sophomore year, and Ramik became friends with two other guys, Hassan and Ahi, the son of acclaimed poet and human rights activist Amiri Baraka. But Ramik also had a wild side. He and friends from his old neighborhood were getting into fights with other boys, and he was always in some kind of mischief. But he was very smart, especially in science and math. He would be cutting up in class one minute and then ace a test that practically everybody else had failed the next. Very few new students were able to make it in the advanced placement courses at University High if they hadn't attended junior high school there. Ramik was one of the few. He also had an activist spirit and a heart to help people. He was the first to protest an injustice, and he questioned everything. Our instructors never would have guessed that for most of high school, Ramik wanted to be a teacher. Ramik became popular pretty quickly by acting in school plays. In the ninth grade, he won the starring role of Scrooge in a play based on Charles Dickens' classic, A Christmas Carol. This was a huge upset because he'd ousted an older guy who captured the lead role in the school play each year. Ramik was later cast as the father in Lorraine Hansberry's play, A Raisin in the Sun. As a sophomore, Ramik joined Hassan and Ahi in forming a group called the United Students Organization, USO, at our school. Ahi shared many of his father's views about self-preservation, self-reliance, and community organization. That appealed to Ramik, who had grown up around uncles who belonged to the Nation of Islam. Students from several Newark public schools belonged to USO, which began to meet at Essex County College to plan strategies for improving the schools. Sam and I attended meetings every now and then, but Ramik was one of the leaders. Eventually, the meetings moved to the basement of the Baraka home. The group attracted the most attention in our junior year when it organized a student walkout and overnight sit-in at the Board of Education to demand a multicultural curriculum and to protest state budget cuts in education financing. Despite a student population that was overwhelmingly black and Hispanic, public high schools in Newark did not offer classes that taught our history. On a cool morning in April of 1990, hundreds of students walked out of class and spilled into the streets in front of and alongside the school. 
we boarded public buses headed to Military Park. Along the way, the buses grew more crowded as students from Shabazz, Central, and other high schools joined the protest. From Military Park, we marched a block to the North Board of Education headquarters. We locked arms and chanted. Cars honked as we completely blocked traffic. Police showed up and tried to stop us because we didn't have a permit, but we kept marching. What were they going to do? Beat us, sick their dogs on us, and throw us in jail, as police down south had done to the civil rights protesters of the 1960s. It was one of the few times when students from rival high schools came together for a useful purpose. When we made it to the board office, police and security guards were standing in front of the door to block our entrance. Our leaders demanded to speak to the superintendent, but the crowd of students grew impatient and we began pushing our way inside. Police arrested Hassan and Ahi. Students took over the lobby. We sat in rows on the floor. Executive School Superintendent Eugene Campbell eventually came out and addressed us. He also summoned Assemblyman Willie Brown and State Senator Winona Littman, who spoke to us. Hours passed. At lunchtime, Superintendent Campbell had sandwiches, milk, and juice handed out to us. By nightfall, many students, including Sam and I, had left. We had to go to our part-time jobs. But a few parents, supportive of our cause, brought blankets and pillows. School officials ordered a pizza dinner for the remaining students. Ramik was among the 50 or so students who spent the night at the board's headquarters. In the weeks afterward, a committee of parents, students, and educators met to develop a curriculum that included African-American studies and the history of other minority groups. The next year, University High offered a course in African-American and Hispanic history. As one of the leaders of the protest, Ramik realized that school administrators would probably be watching him closely, and he began to attend classes more often. But his mischievous side still surfaced from time to time. One of his practical jokes almost got him kicked out of University High for good. Ramik didn't like his biology teacher, so he often skipped her class. When he skipped class one day, he decided to return to play a prank on her. He knocked on her door, and when she opened it, he was standing there with a can of silly string. Without saying a word, he sprayed a web of the colorful, sticky stuff up, down, and across her face and dashed away. When she turned to face her class, the students burst out laughing. The teacher was humiliated and furious. The principal summoned Ramit to the office and suspended him indefinitely. The superintendent of the Newark Public School System banned him from University High School. The teacher told authorities that she had had an allergic reaction to the spray, and she threatened to file criminal charges against Ramit. The incident was the talk of the school. During his appeal hearing before the superintendent, Ramit pleaded for another chance. He apologized to the teacher who was sitting in the room. He said he didn't mean to harm her and promised never to do anything like that again. He presented supportive letters from another teacher at the school and from Amiri Baraka. He also had an unexpected ally that day, the offended teacher. When Ramik finished his presentation, she addressed the superintendent softly. Don't kick him out of school for that, she said. Let him come back. Ramik never knew what changed her mind, but she didn't file charges, and the superintendent lifted the suspension, allowing Ramik to return to school. Ramik could be a real hothead and prankster, but I liked him. I could see even then that he was a really good guy. Sam and Ramit became friends first. They were among the few students who owned cars in our junior and senior years. And owning a car in high school made you instantly popular. All the girls wanted to date you, and all the guys wanted to be your friend. That's part of what initially drew them together. Ramit owned a Mitsubishi Cordia and Sam an Audi 5000, a cool car mentioned in many rap songs at the time. They often got together on Friday nights and weekends for parties and dates. Sam picked me up sometimes, and I got to know Ramit through him. I didn't party as much as the two of them did back then, and I didn't drink anything stronger than soda. They drank, but one of the things I really liked about them was that they never hassled me or tried to push me to drink. I could be myself with them. All three of us worked part-time. 
Sam and Ramit worked at McDonald's. I stocked shelves at Murray Steaks in my freshman year, cooked pizza at Chuck E. Cheese my sophomore year, and sold chocolate chip cookies at Mrs. Fields my senior year. Sam and I were really into baseball and played on the school's baseball team all four years of high school. Sam played shortstop and pitcher and was co-captain of the team while I played first base. Since Ramik was hanging out with us now, he wanted to try out for the team too, but he had never played before. Sam and I agreed to teach him. One day after school, Sam drove us to a park so Ramik could practice batting against a pitching machine. We talked him through the game and showed him how to swing the bat. Ramik took his place in the batting cage. The machine pitched the ball. Ramik swung with all his might. He missed. A second ball shot out. He swung again and missed. A third ball came. He missed that one too. The balls kept coming and Ramit kept missing. We urged him to hold the bat this way or that. Nothing helped. Sam and I doubled over in laughter as our friend swung futilely at those flying balls. Finally, Ramit quit. I'm better at playing girls than baseball, he said. So I'll just stick with what I know. Just before the baseball season in my senior year, I broke my leg. I had been playing basketball with some friends and made a wrong move, and my leg snapped. I still went to practice to watch, and Sam drove out of his way every day to drop me off at home for the entire time that I wore a cast. The more the three of us hung out, the more we realized how much we had in common. We had long conversations about our families and the crazy things we witnessed in our neighborhoods. We also talked about school, what grades we made on a certain test, which teachers we liked and disliked, and what we wanted to do with our lives. It was clear that, like me, Sam and Ramit wanted to make something out of their lives, even though all three of us were still fuzzy about what careers we wanted to pursue. Though he gave his teachers a hard time, Ramit wanted to be a teacher. He wanted to reach boys like himself, who seemed tough and incorrigible on the outside, but really just needed guidance. A counselor has suggested that Ramit consider engineering because he was so good in math and science. At first, the only college he was seriously considering was Howard University in Washington, D.C., where his two other buddies, Hassan and Ahi, were planning to go. Sam talked about becoming a businessman, but he never mentioned going to college until our senior year. No one in his family had ever gone to college, and he didn't really think it was an option for him. Over the years, I had considered at least a dozen other professions. One minute it was nursing, the next some kind of lab technician, but then, unexpectedly, my old dream was revived. When our teacher told us that a recruiter from Seton Hall University was going to give a presentation in the library, she gave us a choice, either stay in class or go to the presentation. The three of us didn't really feel like staying in class. Out in the halls, we concocted an alternative plan. We would walk down the hall as though we were headed to the library, then sneak over to the gym. We were old pros at it by then. A teacher must have sniffed out our little scheme because somehow, and to this day, I don't remember exactly how, we ended up in the library. Sam, Ramit, and I sat at a back table. As the session opened, we were goofing off, only half listening. First, the recruiter tried to sell us on the university's basketball team, which happened to be playing well that year, 1990. I love basketball, but I didn't intend to play in college and I wasn't really moved by her spiel. Then she began to talk about the lack of minorities in the health profession. She said Seton Hall was dedicated to training more minority students to enter medicine as doctors through a program that provided free tutoring, counseling, and other support. My ears tuned in. The pre-medical, pre-dental plus program was and still is one of the several initiatives under the umbrella of the Educational Opportunity Program created at Seton Hall in 1968, when black communities in Newark and other cities across the nation were rioting for civil and human rights. The EOP was designed to make higher education possible for poor students who have the ability to succeed in college, but are undereducated and would likely be eliminated during the normal college admissions process. The EOP finances dozens of specialized programs that provide money for tuition, housing, counseling, tutoring, assessment testing, 
and more to hundreds of needy students. The state added the pre-medical, pre-dental plus program under the EOP in 1980 because so few minority students were becoming doctors. The program accepts students based on high school academic records, teacher recommendations, and personal interviews. SAT scores are considered, but they matter less than in the normal admissions process. Until that moment, when I heard about the program from the recruiter, I had no real plan. I knew I was going to college. That was it. But this program seemed to lay out all of the steps for me. I could hardly believe my ears. I thought to myself, free college, free tutoring, help getting into dental school. This is it. This is the way to do what I've always wanted to do. I lingered a few minutes in the library to talk to Sam and Ramit. I could tell right away that I was more excited about the program than they were. They were my boys, and I thought it would be cool for us to go to college together. What did you think of what the lady said, I asked. It was all right, one of them responded. Man, I think I want to do this, I added. Why don't we go ahead and do this together? Of the three of us, Ramik was always the most skeptical. So, as expected, he was reluctant to commit. He didn't want to bother with all the paperwork, he said. Besides, he already had plans to go with two other friends to Howard University in Washington, D.C. Sam, always the analyst, wasn't interested in spending eight years in school. It seemed like such a long time to him. He was so good with numbers that he could remember telephone numbers without writing them down and do long mathematical problems in his head. And he felt that he had the head and personality for business. But he had no idea how to become a businessman. And he didn't know anyone in the field who could help him develop those talents. I was the only one who had ever even thought of becoming a doctor before that day. But the truth is, none of us had seen anything to make us believe it was really possible. Sometimes, though, you just have to step out there and believe in something you can't quite see. And something deep down was telling me this was one of those times. Man, we could go to college for free, I emphasized. What do we have to lose by applying? Let's do this, I said in as persuasive a voice as I could muster. Finally, they gave in. We would apply to Seton Hall, go to college together, then go to medical school and stick with each other till the end. We didn't lock hands in some kind of empty symbolic gesture, nor did we think much farther ahead, like what would happen if one of us got accepted and the others didn't. We just took one another at his word and headed back to class without even a hint of how much our lives were about to change. Hope, George. And then before we knew it, we were seniors. How you coming along with that application, man? I asked Sam and Ramik almost daily once the school year began. I wanted to make sure they kept up their end of the deal. By January, most of our classmates were either still working on their college applications or waiting for a response. A few of the early birds had already received acceptance letters. Ramik still planned to apply to Howard University in Washington, D.C. And despite his promise, Sam couldn't decide whether he wanted to spend eight years in medical school or pursue a degree in business. I have heartily applied to two other colleges, but my focus was on the pre-medical, pre-dental plus program at Seton Hall. As the deadline drew near, our competitiveness helped us rush the process along. When one of us finished part of the application and bragged about it, the other two hurried to complete theirs. By early spring, we were invited to Seton Hall for an interview. I went first. My mother drove me to South Orange, a suburb about a half hour from downtown Newark. We knew immediately when we crossed the border. On one side, houses were boarded up. The streets were full of litter and people were hanging on the corner in the middle of the day. On the other, houses and lawns were magazine cover beautiful. The streets were clean and the air was quiet. For the entire ride, I kept wondering whether I could really make it in college. I thought I'd have to be a genius to get in and I was scared to death. My mother and I found our way to the campus past the old buildings and perfectly print lawn to the basement office of Carla Dixon, the student development specialist for the program. Her smile seemed genuine as she greeted us. My heart started racing like Carl Lewis when she began the questions. She asked why I wanted to become a doctor. I tried to look calm as I shared with her the story of the dentist 
who had first sparked my interest in dentistry. She asked questions about my family and background. When she asked where I wanted to work after graduation, I figured she was trying to gauge whether I would be interested in returning to work in a community like the one where I grew up. My dream has always been to open a dental clinic in Newark someday. And that's what I told her. Later, I discovered I had been right. One of the goals of the pre-medical pre-dental plus program is to train medical professionals to staff hospitals and clinics in urban areas. Carla met Ramit and Sam in later interviews. I had told her they were my friends and that we wanted to go to college together. When it was Sam's turn to be interviewed, ever the analyst, he showed up with a list of questions. Would he have to change to fit in at Seton Hall? How would he be able to afford it? And what kind of support could he expect from the university? It was important to all three of us that no matter where we went to college, we didn't forget where we came from or change our hip hop style. Carla tried to reassure Sam that he wouldn't have to change to succeed at Seton Hall and that if accepted, he would receive financial aid and counseling from the university. The reassuring tone of the interviews gave us all confidence that we would be accepted. A few weeks later, I returned home from school and found a letter to me from Seton Hall on the table. I had been accepted to the program. I called Sam and Ramit. They too had received acceptance letters. In the meantime, Ramit had also been accepted to Howard University. The university had even assigned him a room. But when he received a letter asking for a deposit to secure the room, he couldn't come up with the money before the deadline. And it occurred to him that he would not be able to afford Howard University without financial aid. Finally, Ramik and Sam decided that the program at Seton Hall was too good to pass up. We didn't say anything more to solidify our pact, but from then on, our commitment to each other became stronger. We began planning our future together. For me, getting accepted into Seton Hall relieved the pressure of not knowing for sure what would happen next. I could finally relax and enjoy my senior year. In our final days of school, Ramit, Sam, and I did the kinds of things that seniors everywhere do to make memories of their last year. I took my girlfriend to the prom. Sam and Ramit brought dates too. Shahid and I put our money together, rented a limousine, and double dated. The cost of the limo and tuxedo hit my pockets pretty hard, and I didn't enjoy myself. I didn't even dance. My girlfriend and I had been dating for about seven months. I really liked her, and I was a faithful kind of guy, but I was about to embark on the greatest challenge of my life, and I didn't want any distractions. About a month later, we broke up. Breaking up with my girlfriend whenever I started a new phase of my life would become a pattern. And finally, there was graduation. It was one of the few times that I saw my father who joined the rest of my family in the auditorium at University High. Sam's and Ramit's families were there too. They snapped photos and cheered as we marched into the auditorium in our burgundy caps and gowns. The day was a scorcher, at least 90 degrees, and some of the guys rebelled by wearing shorts instead of traditional dress slacks under their gowns. The three of us played by the rules and wore the traditional attire. For our parents, this was a historic event. Their sons were not only headed to college, but were planning to become doctors. We had survived the streets of Newark, and that was no small reason to be grateful. Boys our age were dying every day. Our friend Ahi Baraka had barely survived the year before. A man who had robbed Ahi's older brother of $3 spotted the brothers riding through the neighborhood about 1 a.m. the next morning and fired into their car. Ahi sitting in the passenger seat, ducked when he heard the gunshots, but was wounded in the head. Amazingly, Ahi recovered and made it back to school in time to graduate with the rest of us. I don't remember much of the pomp and circumstance of our graduation day, but I remember the emotion of it. We all knew our lives were about to change big time. We all had dreams, but who really knew whether those dreams would materialize? Until that moment, our paths had been set. Elementary school, junior high school, high school. Now we were on our own. As I sat in the auditorium as a student at University High School for the last moments, I was sad about leaving my classmates, 
but I also felt calm. I knew I wouldn't have to face the uncertainty of the future alone. Peer pressure, George. People often ask me how I avoided getting caught up in some of the negative things that many of the guys in my neighborhood were doing when I was growing up. I often thought about that question myself. There wasn't anything special about me, but I'd have to say that the kinds of friends I chose, positive guys who wanted to do the right thing, made a huge difference in how my life turned out. In my experience, friends have more influence on one another's lives than almost anyone else does, especially in those teenage years when kids are trying to discover who they really are. So hooking up with the wrong crowd can really drag you down. Think about it. Most kids, rich or poor, spend more time with their friends than with their parents. They're together all day at school, they're together in the neighborhood after school, and they're together on the weekends. Maybe they even spend their summers together at summer camp. Their friends define what is acceptable and cool. I've never known a kid who doesn't want to be accepted, myself included. That can be particularly dangerous among boys because something about our makeup or upbringing suggests that to be macho is to be cool. And the wrong set of friends can persuade us that to prove how tough we are, we have to do crazy things from small acts of defiance or bravado, like shoplifting, daring kids to do things we'd never do ourselves or bullying to more serious behavior, like using or selling drugs, getting into fights, stealing cars, robbing people or worse. That's why it's so important to hang with the right people. As a kid, I aligned myself with guys who thought like me, guys who did their work in school and avoided the negative stuff. And many of the friends I chose in my neighborhood were younger. I guess in some ways that satisfied my need to be accepted because they looked up to me. I was pretty much winging it back then, just doing what felt right to me. But with hindsight, I realized that avoiding the older, more intimidating boys and even becoming a big brother to my friends was an excellent strategy. It allowed me to set the standard in my group for what was cool. I wasn't into drug dealing, stealing, or scheming, so my friends weren't either. There were always other guys doing other things, but they didn't bother me, and I didn't bother them. In high school, I followed the same pattern and chose friends who did well in school but still like to have fun. That's what drew me to Ramik and Sam. We had the same core desire to make something of our lives, and we brought out the best in one another. We weren't exactly alike, but that was okay. They never tried to pressure me to indulge. In fact, they never even drank in front of me, so we were cool. I had to put up with some good-natured ribbing every now and then from some of our friends, but I knew it was all in fun. I suppose those were the times when my own confidence came into play. I didn't like the taste of alcohol, and that was that. Even though Ramik and Sam would eventually follow neighborhood friends into trouble, I admire them for having the good sense to recognize that those friends were no good for them and for having the guts to break away. I'm not foolish enough to believe that I was able to avoid negative peer pressure alone. In the kind of neighborhood where I grew up, it would have been easy to believe that what I saw was all there was to life. But I had a third grade teacher who taught me how to dream and to think for myself. I had a friend whose father spent good time with me and made me feel I was worthy of a father's love. And most of all, I had a mother who worked hard and managed to keep things straight at home. When I look back over my life and the lives of my friends, I also see that involvement in school and community activities helped us to avoid the negative pull of our peers. I joined the Shakespeare Club in elementary school and the Police Athletic League in elementary and junior high, and I played baseball in high school. Sam took Kung Fu lessons from grade school through his early years in high school and also played on our high school baseball team. And Ramit took drama lessons in junior high school and joined the drama club and the United Students Organization in high school. Those activities gave us fun things with which to occupy our minds and our time. But perhaps even more valuable, they provided safe places for us to meet other kids who shared the same interests. It's hard to have the confidence 
especially in the teen years, to stand up for what you believe is right when people all around you are pulled in another direction. That's where having positive friendships can really help. If you find the right guys to hang with, guys you trust, who share your values and friendship, you'll find that you can stand up to almost anything. You may even be surprised how much you can accomplish together. I certainly was.